So now uh, Eduardo has mentioned a little bit already about the early plants that were found in Rondonia. And uh, we're going to now look specifically at uh, how plants are domesticated in the landscape. So we're going to talk about two kinds of behaviors here. And these have come to be called niche construction behaviors. Niche construction is an idea that oh, came out of ecology and evolution and has passed over into archaeology and anthropology in the last few years. And it has to deal with how humans domesticate landscapes and plant animals. And domestication is one of our human traits that is quite old. We started domesticating fire before we were even human. Homo erectus started domesticating fire about 800,000 years ago. And we have good evidence from Australia that modern humans were domesticating landscapes by 5,000, by 50,000 years ago. So, domestication of landscape can be considered a modern human behavior. And then we have information about the domestication of plants and animals by at least 15,000 years ago, okay? Ooh. Perhaps the wolf was domesticated even earlier. And perhaps the oh, African gourd, the Nadia Cecilia, Cecilia, was domesticated or 15,000 years ago and tr transferred around the tropical world. So what we're talking about is humans that were arriving in the Amazon sometime between 15 and perhaps 25,000 years ago were not only hunters and gatherers, but they were domesticators, <coughs> okay? And to domesticate, you also not only select, but propagate. So these people were planting as well as hunting and gathering, okay? So let's look at landscape domestication for an instance here. Now, Umberto asked me to define the terms. <coughs> so. Here is a definition. So, landscape domestication is an unconscious behavior and a conscious behavior. Remember that humans only use about 10% of their mental capacity. That means the other 90% of things that we do is unconscious, okay? So, unconsciousness is very important in any of our activities, including cultural activities. So, with these ooh, techniques that we use, we change landscapes, landscape ecology, and especially the demography of plant and animal populations in the landscapes. Creating landscapes that tend to be more productive and more congenial for humans. And these are called the cultural okay? so a landscape where we've modified the composition of the demography of the plants and animals and is a precondition for the domestication of plants and animals themselves. <clears throat> so since we're talking about a process, any process has a beginning, but it never has an end. Okay, so <laughs> At the beginning, especially in the Americas, just like in Australia before the, the humans arrived in a pristine environment. In other words, an environment in which humans had not existed previously. And when they started modifying the uh, environment, we can call this the beginning of domestication or promotion. Promotion is a term that comes from 
the Australian example. It's probably because my pocket is full of other stuff. <laughs> I wasn't thinking about it. Okay. So now I can't move, even if I wanted to. Okay. <clears throat> and so ooh, we're talking about a continuum of change across a, the landscape, starting from pristine to promoted to managed, which is a much more conscious activity, and then to cultivation. And of course, in any of these landscapes, we can have the built environment, where people actually live, their homes and their local gardens and what have you. We are in one of our built exam uh, environments right now, of course. Right? So this is one continuum of change in the landscape. And oh, this is a very important precondition to the next type of landscape, uh, to the next type of domestication. Now, domestication is a coevolutionary process in which oh, humans select interesting phenotypes, and this selection, when propagated, results in changes in the next population's phenotypes and genotypes that makes them more useful to humans and better adapted to the domesticated landscapes. Okay, so you see immediately the interaction between these two kinds of domestication. And just as in the case of landscape domestication, in plant or animal domestication, there is a continuum from wild to incipient to semi and finally domesticated. Domesticated is when the plant can no longer survive without its humans. Think of maize. The ear of maize is nicely wrapped in those leaves around the seeds. No, eh? Those seeds cannot escape from that oh, ear of maize and propagate themselves in the wild. Okay, this is dependence upon humans, okay? And we, humans, depend upon our species. Well, this is coevolution. Both parts of the symbiosis are favored, okay? So think about maize today versus maize 10,000 years ago. 10,000 years ago, the wild maize may have had populations of uh, a couple million ooh, plants of maize in southwestern Mexico. Today, there's much more maize alive at any one instance than there are humans. Okay, so maize is clearly dependent upon us for its reproductive success. But without maize and wheat and the other cereals and the other food crops, we wouldn't have the population we have today. Okay, so we can get into this coevolution in a lot more detail over beer tonight. But let's go on and talk now <coughs> about what this means in space and time. Okay, so niche, in, niche construction or cultural niche selection and cultural niche construction theory suggests that where people live, they domesticate landscapes and plants and animals. I'm not talking about animals because only one was domesticated in the Amazon, a duck. And when people move, they take their plants and they domesticate new landscapes, okay? And when people trade, they don't only trade or in, uh, inanimate objects. They trade seeds and cuttings. So they trade their plants. And these behaviors create legacies in the landscapes across space 
and some can be read through time. So those seeds of maize that Eduardo showed you that they've been finding at Teotonio along the upper Madeira are an example of distribution across space and through time from very early dates until the present. Right? And one of the things that's very important for us now in our workshop here is how human landscape domestication legacies can be looked at across space at different time moments. So uh, Andre Junquera has looked at how uh, domesticated landscapes in the general area of villages uh, are related to the distance from the village. Okay? So in the village, obviously the whole landscape is domesticated. And as we move out from the village, we go out into the closer fields and the further fields and into a managed forest. And so we have a curve, which is precisely what we would expect if humans are lazy. And humans are very lazy. I'm lazy. Okay, and so this is the kind of thing that we expect. But in anthropology, this is called central place foraging theory. Okay, and it's exactly what we expect. And Carolina Levis has looked at the relative abundance of useful tree species in the forest. As you move away from the edge of the river, which is the... Uh, proxy for where humans settle, okay? And near the river, as much as 40% of the trees in the forest are useful. And as you move away, it can drop off to 10%. Is 10% the baseline? We have no idea. Because as Marie Pierre showed, the forest that is of today in the Amazon is a very recent forest, a forest that co-evolved with humans. Okay, so we have no idea what the baseline is in the modern forest, okay? So, in order to study distribution, first we have to find out what the origin is. And uh, Alfonso de Candolet and later on Nikolai Vavivlov talked about the multidisciplinary task of identifying origins to allow people to then study distributions. So we need botany, we need genetics, which I'm going to use a lot now in this talk, but it's important to remember that genetics deals with essentially living plants, things that are the final result of landscape domestication, of dispersals, and what have you, okay? Which is different from archaeology, which has concrete evidence of different moments in the past, like the maize seeds that Eduardo showed us. And then we can combine these into biogeography to see the patterns of distribution. And history is often useful. Unfortunately, in the Amazon, it's very recent, okay? In areas like China, for example, history is very important. Ethnography and ethnohistory give us information about how indigenous people think about their own history. And this is often considered to be myth. But sometimes the myths are very useful. And I'll give an example of one of these. <clears throat> and linguistics. With linguistics, we can also reconstruct ideas about the past, okay? So we'll use this now to talk about possible origins. So in this map, we have several species that have no question mark after the name. So cacao, kubu, sweet potato, we're quite sure that they were domesticated near where this word is on the map. When there is a question mark, we're not sure. 
okay? And so there are more question marks on this map than there are areas that we're sure about having domestication. <clears throat> and one thing that is important in this map is that things happen more in the periphery of the Amazon than in the center, okay? And Guarana, which is one that I'll talk about, is a very recent domesticate, okay? And so what does archaeology tell us? In the Amazon, very little, because archaeobotany is just starting. Eduardo's group has adopted this part of archaeology only in the last five, six, seven years, okay? And he's the pioneer, okay? There's very little other archaeobotany going on in the Amazon. So we can look to the Pacific Coast, where the conditions for conservation are excellent. And Capsicum chinensis, which is not from China, came is visible in the archaeological record before 9,000 years ago. And manioc and sweet potato before 8,000. And guava, we're not sure whether it's from lowland South America or from Mesoamerica, 6,000 years ago. And this is the same date as for maize. Okay, so maize was arriving from Mesoamerica before 6,000 years ago, and guava may have come together. None of them are native to the Pacific coast. So the domestication must have started earlier in wherever the crop originated, okay? So manioc, we know where it originated. Sweet potato, capsicum, we've got a pretty good idea, although there was, an inter, uh, there was a question mark after the name, okay? <laughs> and so we have an idea that people started to domesticate and then started to distribute, okay? People are very unlikely to distribute wild plants very far, okay? So we're talking about if manioc was on the Pacific coast earlier than 8,000, well, at least 1,000, maybe 2,000 years earlier, it started to be domesticated in the Amazon, which is the end of the Holocene. <clears throat> Now, in a recent paper, oh, Meyer and her colleagues looked at a set of oh, 203 species around the world and found that over the millennia, humans domesticated with greater intensity and lesser intensity in each of the major centers of domestication. And so, in their sample of Amazonia, which is only 15 species, or 18 species, you can see that none started as early as I just claimed, okay? And then there was a break, a little bit more, and domestications really picked up just before conquest, okay? We're not sure if the full sample of 1,000 plus domesticates around the world will show the same trends, but this suggests that part of the evidence that Marie Pierre was talking about, that Eduardo was talking about, that in various places, environmental conditions were favorable at some time in the Holocene and then less favorable, this might be reflected in the history of domestication also, okay? So now I'd like to move away from theory and generalities and get into specifics about some of these species. And so manioc, who you all know is the most important starch. Ooh, chocolate is the food of the gods. Nah. Ooh, Bactris gossipies is what I've been working with for almost 40 years. The guarana is a magic stimulant, and we'll see why it's so magical. And ooh, Brazil nut, or today it's called the Amazon nut. When I first started, it was para nut, nah? is the emblematic nut, okay? And so we'll look a little bit at each one of these to see what we know about origins and dispersals of these, okay? <clears throat> so, manioc. And manioc today is very important for its farinha, its flour. But this may have 
may be an artifact of colonial history. But we have a good idea from genetics where manioc was domesticated. Okay, so well, this group of Olsen and Schall, with support from Brazil's Embrapa Research Institution, collected wild manioc all across southern Amazonia. Okay, and these are the open forests of the transition between the closed forests of the central Amazon and the savannas of central Brazil. <clears throat> and they oh, sequenced a, an important enzyme and they took microsatellite markers, and I won't go into the full details of these, but microsatellites are very popular oh, genetic markers that we use a lot. And <clears throat> They compared the wild populations with a very specific set that represents all of the culti cultivated populations of the world. Okay, and this is what is called the core collection of the manioc germplasm bank at Seat, Colombia. <clears throat> and all of the why all of the cultivated manioc has the same enzyme sequence and the same alleles from these microsatellites as these wild populations from Rondonia, Mato Grosso, and Acre, and certainly Bolivia. Because these collections were done after the oh, Convention on Biodiversity, Brazilians have difficulty collecting in Bolivia and vice versa. Okay, so certainly these wild populations in this region of Bolivia are involved also in this story, okay? So we have the origin. In Mexico, maize has the origin in a specific river valley. Why don't we have this for manioc? Well, because nobody has reworked this analysis to get a better oh, idea of what the origin is. <clears throat> and once it was domesticated, it was distributed, and this is a map of uh, bitter manioc and sweet manioc. And this map is taken from oh, Manuel's paper, where he added an extra column to Law and Perer's paper. <coughs> and this shows that manioc was distributed in two different ways. The bitter manioc is used specifically for making certain types of foods, and especially the farinha, the flour that I showed at the beginning. <clears throat> Sweet manioc oh, tends to be less important in the overall food production system and is much more easy to process. And so this different distribution has caused a lot of consideration about which was originated first the sweet or the bitter. And in the same paper that Manuel presented this map, he raised the hypothesis that sweet came first and then bitter. And this is logical. When people start domesticating 10,000 years ago and don't have the full processing technology available yet, they would select for sweet. And then later on, with technology available, they could select for bitter again. <clears throat> and the linguistic data doesn't help us very much in this case, because manioc started to be domesticated much earlier than any of the languages that are currently spoken in the world. <clears throat> but we can see that in Western Amazonia, the Arawak, and here's the northern and the southern Arawak, considered sweet manioc in southern Arawak to be very important 4,400 years ago. And this is probably bitter manioc, but maybe it's sweet manioc before the redomestication for bitter. Unfortunately, with linguistics, we cannot discriminate between bitter and sweet, okay? But with Molecular markers now, we can. 
So Jill de Moulin has got this ready for publication and has allowed us to show this to you. And she collected about 600 samples of manioc across Brazil and a lot in the savannas and a lot in the Amazon. And when we look, when we try to simulate what is a population with this Bayesian methods, we can find out that immediately the Bayesian simulation separates everything that is bitter from everything that is sweet, okay? And then at the next level of the analysis, we get out two sweet groups. And at the last level, we get out two bitter groups, okay? So what does this suggest? If we put this in a different kind of analysis, we see that sweet, which is green, is at the base of this tree. And that means sweet came first, just as Manuel hypothesized in, <coughs> without any genetic data, just on the logic of how people domesticate things, okay? And look at this. Ooh, sweet in the upper Shingu in the transition to the central Amazonian Cejado. And this was related to the Amazonian uh, sweet that was also taken along the Brazilian coast, probably by the Tupi Guarani, okay, which will be subject of a uh, talk here later on. Huh? <clears throat> okay, so manioc. Sweet first, bitter, and distributed across the Americas before 6,000 years ago. Just like maize. Just the inverse direction. So manioc arrived in Mexico 6,500 years ago, just as maize arrived here 6,500 years ago. So let's talk about the fruit of the gods. Okay, and all of you know chocolate. But many of you may not have actually tested the original chocolate preparation with no sugar, some vanilla, some maize, and hot peppers, okay? And anato, the coloring, okay? So a very nice study by Motomayor and his group financed by one of the largest chocolate companies in the world, which allows them to use 100 microsatellites, nah? changed the way we think about chocolate forever. Before this study, there were three varieties of chocolate. The Coroyo, which is this yellow, nah? and the Fortestero, which is this. And over here in Trinidad in tobacco, there was the Trinitario, which was a hybrid. Okay. So, Motomayor and his group showed that there are actually 10 different genetic groups of chocolate, of cacao, and most of them are in the Amazon. And what's important here are these pink ones, because the pink ones gave origin to the green triangles, which gave origin to the criollo, which was taken up to ooh, Mexico, okay? And all of these other ones, Nobody ever made chocolate out of them until recently, okay? But as we'll see in just a moment, these here in the eastern Amazon are different from these in the rest of the Amazon, okay? So looking at this data set, I noticed that this group has less genetic diversity than all of these groups, similar to the situation with this one which was distributed by humans, okay? <clears throat> and Everett Thomas, who is with us today, nah, reanalyzed Motomayor's data set and showed that there is greater allelic richness in the Western Amazon and than in Mexico or in the Eastern Amazon. Why is allelic richness important? Because before domestication, any population had all of the alleles typical of the wild populations. Once humans start to select, 
just because they're taking small samples out of the large sample, allelic richness drops off every time there's a new selection and every time there's a new distribution, okay? And so if we look at the criollo, the yellow color gets continuously lighter. It's almost invisible up here in oh, southwestern Mexico. Huh? <clears throat> but the same trend happens when you go east. It's not quite as pronounced, partially because it didn't go as far as this one. Okay? And so we have evidence, and oh, Motomayor's data set was not used for this, but Everett Thomas and his group at, oh, then at SIAT, uh, at Bioversity, uh, showed that we probably have two domestications. And so we can look at this with this story. The origin is here, and by at least 5,000 years before present, oh, cacao started to be selected. There's oh, some archeological evidence in this region of Ecuador now by the French group uh, Lanard, and I don't remember his first name, with two possible distributions. One along the ooh, western coast of Ecuador and Colombia, suggested by the dispersal of those green triangles in the first picture. Huh? And the other along the, western, uh, along the eastern side of the Andes, which is suggested by the distribution of Criollo in Colombia and Venezuela. And then up through ooh, Central America into Mesoamerica, where chocolate was invented. And the cacao researchers considered domestication to have occurred with the invention of chocolate. But cacao was distributed much earlier and for the same reason as it was distributed into the Eastern Amazon. And these melanado types have less morphological var variability and less genetic variability, just as we would expect from a domesticated population. What was it used for? Sucking on the pulp around the seed, okay? And certainly fermenting the pulp to make wine. Okay? Humans love to make fermented drinks, <clears throat> which is what's important about Bactris gasipides, the domesticated palm. <clears throat> this photo is proof of domestication. This is the wild type from southwestern Amazonia, and this is one of the many land races from ooh, central western Amazonia. <clears throat> In eastern Amazonia, the fruits are a little bit smaller and oilier, and they're much better for munching on. The starchy ones from the western Amazon are good for making flour, and you can make cake. So over the last 35 years, we've mapped the distribution of numerous cultivated land races and the wild populations associated with this. And until 2000, these were other species. But in 2000, a courageous botanist revised the genus Bactris and put numerous previous species into synonymy with Gassipides. And these are what he considered to be wild. So this green up here in Colombia and Venezuela is type two, the red is type one, and three, uh, and blue is type three. But look at that, type one and type three have a sympatric distribution in southwestern and western Amazonia. Wild plants don't do that. So our courageous botanist made one small mistake. This is the incipient domesticate. And from this region, it was distributed north all the way up into Costa Rica and a little bit of Nicaragua and Honduras and ooh, east into eastern Amazonia. And how do we know that? Well, 
we'll look at the genetics again. And this looks just like the manioc, except that we're a little bit different organization and we're, <coughs> oh, now we're going all the way up into Central America. But let's put this into a tree. <clears throat> and when we look at this initially, we think, opa, we might have two domestications. One from the type one, which was the red population in the map, and one from type three, which was the blue population. And that was our first thought, <clears throat> okay? And well, one domestication came down the Madera River into central Amazonia and further east. And the other went down the Rio Ucayali into western Amazonia and then throughout western Amazonia and all the way up to Central America. Okay? Nice story. But we then looked at the chloroplast. The chloroplast has a genome that's separate from the genome in the nucleus. And the chloroplast is interesting because it is inherited always from the mother. It, there are a few species in which males are involved. But as in humans, males tend to be less or, or more lazy. And so the ladies carry the, the work. No? <clears throat> and so what do we have here? We have an outgroup, which is an unrelated species of Bactris, a small plant that only gets this big. Huh? And it is related to the populations from the upper Madeira River. And the Madeira River populations are related to those downriver, around Manaus and into Biling and what have you, okay? But they're also related to everything that happens in the Western Amazon, except that there's a large marker where 12 bases of DNA have been eliminated, okay? And everything in Western Amazonia has the same lack of 12 base pairs, okay? So what does this tell us? This tells us that Ooh, peach palm was domesticated in the same general area as ooh, manioc and taken east and taken west, okay? And all the way up into Central America, okay? When did this happen? The morphological changes that are evident in this region led me to suggest that the process started probably 10,000 years ago and because the degree of morphological change is at least 1,000%. And that's similar to maize in Mesoamerica, okay? The change here is much less, oh, 300%, okay? So this may have been later, and it was never used for fermenting because it has too much oil. It's good for munching on. This was fermented. It's high starch. Some fruit are 200 grams. And a few fruit will make a liter of beer. Okay? And this is what was taken up into Central America also. So this was very important as a starchy staple used for fermentation. Okay? Which didn't happen elsewhere. So this may have been earlier because the change is more dramatic and this later, because the change is less dramatic. So now let's talk about Guarana. Guarana is a popular ooh, soft drink in Brazil. Ooh, Brazil is one of the few areas of the world where there is actual competition for Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Nah? And this is the Guarana. <clears throat> and there's a legend about the origin of the Guarana and of the Satare Maue people. The Satare Mawe are a group of Tupi, ooh, a specific group found in the lower ooh, Madeira and lower Tapajos rivers in central Amazonia. And I won't tell you the whole uh, legend, because it's quite a complicated legend, but what happened is the 
Ooh, the lady here got pregnant, and her son, ooh, she got pregnant by a cobra, of course, because you can get pregnant in a lot of ways in the Amazon. And, but her brothers killed her son, and she pulled out her son's eyes and planted them. And the left eye gave an origin of false Guarana. And the right eye gave Guarana. And so, what is Guarana? Guarana is an extremely complex polyploid. Okay? The other species in the genus, Paulinia, only have 24 chromosomes. Guarana has 210. And I said it was a magic plant. It has to be magic to fit all those chromosomes into a nucleus the same size as the other nucleus in the genus Paulinia. Okay, so we have a recent domesticate, and this domestication is based on polyploidy, okay? <clears throat> and now let's look at our final example, which is Brazil nut. And <clears throat> Brazil nut stands occur well, in many parts of the Amazon, but especially down along the, from southwest Amazon into the center, a little bit on the Negro and the Solimois, and there's a big empty area. It's just sampling. There's plenty of Brazil nut in this region, okay? On the contrary, there's no Brazil nut in this region until the last few decades, okay? And Sylvain Desmolières mined this information out of the big Radin database, which was collected in the 70s and uh, early 70s, no? and is a very important source for information on trees in Brazilian Amazonia. <clears throat> and very recently, just last year, Everett Thomas's group worked at associating Brazil nut stands with Terra Preta de Índia, with the Amazonian dark earths that Eduardo mentioned and that Manuel will talk more about now. <clears throat> And as you go down the Madeira and into eastern Amazonia, the correlation between Brazil nut stands and Amazonian dark earths increases, okay? Strongly suggesting, as Everett Thomas and his group talked about, human dispersal. <clears throat> and there's another evidence for that. At the same time that Everett was publishing this, Suji, had just published genetic evidence. And again, we have allelic richness. Lots of alleles here in eastern Amazonia and in southwestern Amazonia. Very few between. And a little bit more here, less up here. Suggesting a possible origin here or here. And there are several groups. The northern grouped together. The central ones are not clearly grouped with the southwestern ones. So this still requires more sampling. So possibly we have two domestication events and dispersals out of ooh, eastern Amazonia and southwestern Amazonia. Ooh, Everett Thomas and his group like this especially, but this cannot yet be discarded. Okay, so observe the group of species I presented to you. Only one is an annual crop. All the other ones are trees. Okay, trees tend to be less studied in archaeology. Okay, but remember that the Garden of Eden had more trees than crops. Okay, and so humans certainly who started to domesticate trees at least as early, if not earlier, than annual crops, okay? And why are these less evident? Well, because trees live longer. And people tend not to look at them in farming systems. They look at the small crops, the annual crops, okay? And 
Eduardo and Clyde Mordice have been discussing that the production systems in the Amazon are composed of numerous kinds of domesticated and non-domesticated species. Okay, so the domesticates are the crops and they can be annuals or tree crops. And the non-domesticates, at least 5,000 species of the Amazonian flora are used. So let's pull all this together now. So we have origins along the periphery. We have dispersals of tree crops, such as Brazil nut, and Carolina Levis, who, and some of her colleagues are now pulling together information on other trees that occur in stands, just like Brazil nut, okay? And these men, uh, blotches in the map well, these are where crop genetic resources were distributed at conquest. And it's not by chance that this is where the large populations were found by the first Spanish coming down the river. And Eduardo's group has shown that Terra Preta along the Madeira is just as abundant as along the Solimoy's Amazon suggesting that populations were large there also. So this part of the map is very clearly related to people accumulating crops in areas where they're being used intensively for food production. This area is different. This is a Blackwater River, who, unlike the central Amazon and the Madeira, which are white water. White from the sediments coming down from the Andes. That doesn't happen here on the Negro. Why might we have an accumulation of crop genetic diversity in the Negro? Because this is a center of sociodiversity, okay? And so, large number of different peoples, including farming groups like the Arawak, including what are considered to be hunter-gatherers like the Maku, live in this region, and they accumulate tree and annual crops, okay? So we have the basis for the growth of human societies because human societies depend upon their plants more than anything else. Okay, and so in the Amazon we have the domestication of numerous local species as well as the importation of crops from other places around the Americas, all the way from well, Mesoamerica and also coming up from further south in South America. Okay, so that's the story I wanted to present to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you.